Genesis chapter 2. Again, Jesus, we just invite you to come and speak right now. Genesis chapter 2. Let's start off reading in verse 4. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now, the word man is Adam in Hebrew, where we get the name. Anybody here named Adam? No, that's odd. (laughs) Or you're just really shy. Either way, okay. Um, There's a play on words in the original language. Adam, the man, is made from the Adama, or the ground, meaning there is a symbiotic relationship between human and the earth. At first, human is nothing more, honestly, nothing more than a corpse. But then we read, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became something more. He became, quote, a living being. Humans have no parallel in the universe. Animals, for example, are pure physicality. They don't have what you and I call a soul. They eat, but they don't know how to set a table. They speak in a rudimentary uh, language, basically a bark, but they don't have Shakespeare. They think, but they don't write philosophy. Angels, on the other hand, are pure spirit. They manifest physicality from time to time, but they are made out of spirit. They inhabit a world not of time and space. But Adam, or human, is a hybrid. He's made from the dust, from uncut, raw atomic matter. So he has physicality, but at the same time, God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So he has a spirit. He's an integrated, holistic being. Now, what does this mean? You're thinking, oh, you lost me, dude. I don't care. Here's what this means. You don't have a body. You are a body. Your spirit, however you define that word, and your skeleton and your nervous system and your hair and your skin and your mind and your sex organs and your memory banks and your smile and your personality, it's all you. You know, there's this pervasive um, idea out there right now that the real you is on the inside and that your body is basically a shell and nothing more to carry the real you around because we live in a culture that is obsessed with body image, right? I mean, everywhere we go, how many of us look like the cacophony of images that we see in the media every day? 1% of us, maybe? I mean, you're a beautiful crowd. Maybe 1.5% of you? <laughs> Not me, for sure, right? I was at the gym today. You're thinking you were? Shut up, all right? <laughs> I'm like, everybody there is way better looking than me. It sucks. It's like, I work out twice a week, and I look like this. They work out once a month, and no fair, come on. Seriously, but everywhere we go, we face this. And so people overreact, a lot of us overreact and say stuff like, hey, you need to love me for me, not for my body. And I see what people are saying. There's truth in that for sure. But I don't think I buy the logic. What if I said, listen, you need to love me for me, not for my personality. (laughs) He'd say, wait a minute. But your personality, sadly, is a part of who you are. (laughs) Exactly. That is my point. So you are a body, but at the same time, you are not only your body. You are so much more than flesh and bone. So we live in the day and age of scientism. Not science, but scientism, which is the worldview. Some would call it a religion. I don't think it's that far off. That basically says all that is real is what you can put under a microscope in a laboratory. And I'm not down on science at all. Don't read me wrong. Not at all. It's scientism that I don't buy because I believe there's more. I'm with Jesus. I believe there is more, more than what's visible to the naked eye, more than what you can measure in a petri disc. And, and more to this strange new creature called human than a spinning mass of protons and neutrons and electrons. Now, this has profound implications for Adam and Eve's sexuality, meaning for you and my sexuality. Skip down to the end of the chapter. 
Um, Eve is created from Adam's rib. Uh, If you're new to the Bible, don't get hung up on the rib thing. Are we reading poetry? Are we reading narrative? You're missing the point. The point is that she's, she's just like Adam. She's human. She's made out of the dust. And then we read this in chapter two, verse 23. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why... A man leaves his father and mother. And listen, this is one of the most important sentences in the entire story of God. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. And Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt what? No shame. This is about sexuality. They became one flesh. They were naked, and they felt no shame. Now, the word one is echad in Hebrew. Can you say that? Just keep you awake. I know it's a Wednesday night. Who does something at midnight on a Wednesday night? But here you are, snowpocalypse, sorry. The word one is echad in Hebrew, and it's a graphic, weighty word. In fact, the exact same word is used for God. Later in the Torah, in Deuteronomy, in a famous prayer called the Shema that an Orthodox Jew to this day um, would recite morning and evening, hear the Lord our God, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is echad, or one. And when you combine this graphic, this weighty word echad, with the word one, or sorry, with the word flesh, it basically means fused together at the deepest level. God himself is echad. God is one. God is, in a sense, fused together at the deepest level. And when a man and a woman get married and make love, we catch a glimpse, a hint, a shadow into that kind of oneness. Echad is when the lines blur between a man and a woman. Echad is when you're not really sure who's who anymore. Echad is when you know and you are known. In fact, we read that a chapter or two later in the Genesis story, we read, quote, Adam knew his wife Eve and she became pregnant, end quote. To know is a Hebrew idiom for sex, and it's fitting, because when you make love to another person, you know them at the deepest level in a way that nobody else on the planet does. Now, last session, my main point was basically that sex is good. In fact, it's very good, and you would think that would go without saying. But sadly, in particular in the Western church, it doesn't. It's not God, it's a gift from God for you to enjoy as an act of worship in the right context, marriage. Now this session, I wanna get at the why behind that last part, marriage. Um, If sex is so great, I know what a ton of you are thinking, why in the world limit it to marriage? I mean, come on, if it's tov, if it's very tov, if it's whatever then why in the world wait until I'm like forever old and one person? I mean, there are seven billion people on the planet. One, really? Come on, not half a dozen? I mean, give me a few. Why? It doesn't make any sense. Well, I wanna get into this because not only is sex good, but it's also powerful. In sex, two separate autonomous human beings become one flesh, one entity, one human being. They are fused together at the deepest level. They know each other and are known by each other. And listen, this action cannot be undone. It's irreversible and immutable. And to God, the one and only relationship strong enough to handle that kind of untamed, fierce power is marriage. The one and only container that can handle the nuclear force that we call sex is a lifelong covenant between a man and a woman until death do us part. What are you saying? I'm saying that I think, no, I know that we need to take sex way more seriously than we do. Um, Turn over to 1 Corinthians, to the right, to the New Testament. Let's make our way back to the writings of Paul. This language of echad is reused by him in his letter to the church in Corinth, which is one of the first letters in the New Testament. Now, really fast, a little bit of background on Corinth because it's something of a legend. It it was, without a doubt, the Las Vegas of the ancient Mediterranean. What happens in Corinth stays in Corinth, exactly. 
The city was built on a thin isthmus called the Dolcos in between the Aegean and the Adriatic. Sailors would actually dock in the harbor and then walk the four and a half mile stint to the other side. And so thousands of sailors and travelers and tourists and merchants from all over the Mediterranean made Corinth a hub for prostitution and sex trafficking and all of that. In Paul's day, Corinthian was actually slang for a call girl. I mean, can you imagine? Oh, dude, she's cute. No, dude, she... Watch out, she's a Portlander. <laughs> a true story. She was a Corinthian. So it's a culture of rampant, open, liberal, hypersexualization. Nothing like the city that we live in at all. And let's start off in verse 9. Paul um, writes this, and it's brilliant stuff. Chapter 6, verse 9. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then I love it. That is what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Somebody clap or something, or I don't know. I mean, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. Now, keep reading in 12, and notice this next line is in quotes. I have the right to do anything you say. So in context, in this part of the letter, it's basically, honestly, it's a Q&A. Paul is fielding questions from the Corinthians, and uh, the vast majority of the questions, at least in chapter 6 and 7, are about levology. It's about sex uh, between a married couple, sex between you and a prostitute, you and a stranger, you and your girlfriend, boyfriend, about singleness, about divorce, about all of that stuff. And this line is a quote, meaning Paul's not saying, I have the right to do anything. I love when people quote that. Hey, it says it in the Bible, I have the right to do anything. No, 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 no. That's a quote. All right, Paul goes on to say this. Yes, but not everything is beneficial. Sure, okay, I have the right to, whatever. You're free, you live in America, but not everything is good for you. And then they, here's another quote. I have the right to do anything. Yes, but I will not be mastered by anything. Can you see that you're under the control? It's an addiction. You're not free, you think you're free, it's actually slavery. You're under the control of a sexual addiction or what have you. And then he goes on to say this, here's one more quote. You say, quote, food for the stomach and the stomach for food and God will destroy them both, end quote. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Okay, some more background. Corinth was 50 miles south of a city called Athens, home to Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, and all, I just dated myself there, um, all, no, you guys all know Bill and Ted, right? Yeah. All of the great Greek philosophers, Netflix, thank God for Netflix, all of the great Greek philosophers. And Athens was the birthplace of dualism. So it's the origin of this idea that's still very much around, sadly in the church, in the West at least, this idea that there's a spiritual world, and then there's some kind of an invisible wall, and then there's a physical world. And the spiritual world is good, or at least better, and the physical world is evil, or at least not as good. And uh, Plato, for example, flat out called the body in one of his writings, quote, the prison house of the soul. And because of that, people were basically saying that it doesn't matter what you do in the body because it's just physical. It's not spiritual. It's just physical. And this line of thinking made its way into the church. That's how the Corinthians started to think about sex. Hey, it's just physical. I have a stomach, and when I get hungry, I what? I eat. I have a throat, and when I get thirsty, I drink. I have a body, when I get tired, I sleep. I have sex organs, when I get horny, I have sex with my girlfriend, my fiance, a prostitute. What's the big deal? It's just physical, nothing more. But listen to what Paul says next or rewind to what he says right there. You say food for the stomach, the body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now, the phrase sexual immorality in English is actually one word in Greek, porneia. It's where we get the word pornography, obviously. Long story short, it means any and all sexual activity outside of marriage between a man and a woman in relationship for life. I repeat. 
porneia, or sexual immorality, is any and all sexual activity outside the context of marriage between a man and a woman in relationship for life until death do us part. It's a junk drawer word, meaning it's really, really broad. It's everything from sleeping with your boyfriend and girlfriend to friends with benefits, casual sex, which there's no such thing, more on that later, oral sex, adultery, prostitution, porn, petting, raunchy stuff on TV, adult films, strip clubs down the street, Dante's, all of it. It's all porneia, it's all sexual immorality, and it's all a cheap parody of the beautiful, very good gift that God created in the beginning. And Paul says, listen, the body, which remember, Paul's not a dualist. He's not a Greek philosopher. He's a follower of Jesus. He lives in a Genesis-shaped world, not in a Plato-shaped world or an Athens-shaped world, but a Genesis-shaped world. Paul's not a dualist, right? He gets that not only do you have a body, but you are a body. And he writes that the body was meant for the Lord and vice versa. The Lord was meant for the body, meaning what? Meaning you were made to know God in your body. Your relationship with God doesn't take place in some mythic, far-off spiritual world. It takes place right here, right now, on planet Earth, in your body. Therefore, what you do with your body matters now and forever. That's Paul's logic. He goes on to say, 14, by his power, God raised the Lord, Jesus, from the dead, and he will raise us also. Remember, that doesn't mean go to heaven when you die. His point is that after that, after you go to heaven when you die, you will come back to the earth in a what? In a body. And you will relate to God forever in a what? Body. Therefore, what you do now in your body matters, not only for 50 or 60 or 80 or however many years you live by the grace of God, but for forever. And then he goes on to say this, do you not know, based on all of that theology, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Now, a bunch of you are in my church, and you're pretty messed up. It's okay, so am I, so I like lead the charge. Welcome, we're really happy. You're like, I'm not going to your church. You are an intelligent thinking person. Um, But I've never had to like, lay into you for going to prostitutes. Stop it, all of you. But that's what's happening right here. And seriously, that's what's happening. Paul is getting after the Corinthians. Seriously, you're going to prostitutes. What are you thinking? Because they were thinking, what's the big deal? It's just physical, come on. It's my girlfriend, it's my boyfriend. Heck, we're about to get engaged. We are engaged. We're a month from the wedding, come on. Medding, I'm sorry, I'm getting tired now. We're a month away. I mean, come on, what's the big deal? It's just physical. It's just sex. That's all it is. What's the big deal? And then he goes on to write this in 16. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, and this next line is a quote verbatim straight out of Genesis chapter two, quote, the two will become what? One flesh. That's echad all over again. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him. He's saying, don't you get it? Sex is about so much more than sex. In sex, two people become one flesh. That means, that means what? That means that God's view of sex, and listen to me, is actually much higher than culture at large. It's easy to miss that with all the negative rhetoric about sex in the church, but it's true. Culture basically says sex is recreational play between two consenting adults. That's all it is. It's just biological. It's just the momentary coupling of two bodies for sexual release. It's basically play for grown-ups. But God says, no, it's so much more. It's two separate, autonomous human beings, there we go again, fused into one entity, reconnecting that oneness, refusing that oneness over and over again through the pleasure of self-giving sex as you express and you enjoy your love with your husband and your wife. 
You know, one of the major mistakes we've made in the church, at least in my opinion, over the last few decades, is we bought into culture at large's definition of sex as recreational play between two consenting adults. And then we've said, okay, here's where you can and can't do it. Here's all the rules. You can do it in marriage, nowhere else. Oh yeah, and it has to be marriage between a man and a woman. But I'm not attracted to a woman, doesn't matter. And for all sorts of people, either who are not followers of Jesus or who are followers of Jesus, but sadly have bought into culture's definition, that is nonsensical. It's, it's, illog- doesn't, it's stupid. I mean, you think, what kind of dumb, outdated, old school, unthinking tradition is that? I am not my grandma. I mean, come on. Because we bought into culture's definition. Meaning, before we talk about where you should and you should not make love to another person, and is it same sex, is it not? Before you talk about any of that, first, you have to talk about what sex is, about what actually happens when a man and a woman take off their clothes and make love to each other. And I would argue that we need not a lower, but a higher view of what happens when a man and woman make love. When, because two people become one flesh. That's why there's no such thing as casual sex. It's a myth. Because sex involves all of you, not just your body, but all of you. That's why couples who sleep together early in the relationship often end up dating way longer than they should. Even when all of their friends, all of your family are saying, what are you thinking? Come on, you're not a good fit for each other. You're not a good match. What, what is wrong with you? But they don't see it. They are blind. Nine times out of 10, they are sleeping together. And sex fused them together at a primal, deep, profound, physical and spiritual level that is hard to break. And what should have been a relationship that lasted a few months and ended in a magnanimous, fine, gracious parting of ways ends up as a relationship that lasts a few years and ends in heartache and regret and pain because you leave a piece of yourself behind with every partner you have. The more people you sleep with, the more you start to hollow yourself out until you have little or nothing to give away. Now, once again, inside of marriage, this is beautiful. Sex is like gravity. It keeps two separate autonomous human beings, one flesh, one entity, in sync and in tune. It is written that love covers a multitude of sins, and sex sure helps. (laughs) But outside of marriage, this can be dehumanizing and destructive. Sex can turn men and women into objects for self-gratification. So much of what we call love is in reality nothing more than lust. If you say, I love her, but what you actually mean, if you're straight up and you're honest, is every time I'm around her, I want to have sex with her. Right or wrong, that at its core is selfish and narcissistic. That's the problem with the word love. Usually what we mean by love is deep feelings of affection, Right, we mean, oh, I love her, meaning when I'm around her or him, I feel so happy. And that's beautiful, that's romantic. I'm not down on that at all. The only problem with that is it's the exact same definition as narcissism. Minor problem, that's it. But so often, this is how we come at it. And every time you break a cod, a part of you is lost. Some of you know the pain all too well is 15 or 20 or 30 minutes of ecstasy and fun and play really worth all the trauma. That's why Paul's closing line in 18 is this. Flee from sexual immorality. Run for your life from porneia. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. What an interesting way to put it. Sins against their own body. When you step outside of God's relational framework for sex, which is marriage between a man and a woman, you're doing damage to who? To yourself and to your spouse, your girlfriend, your fiance, to yourself. And there is no prophylactic for the pain of sexual immorality because none of us are immune. Now, I just want to acknowledge 
like the tension in the room right now. I mean, maybe your soul is bleeding right now because you have learned this truth the hard way. If only you could go back in time, if only you could do it all over again, if only dot, 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 then maybe you would not have to deal with the pain, you would not have to deal with the guilt, you would not have to deal with the breakup, you would not have to deal with the damage and the heartache. Listen, here's the good news. Sex is powerful, but God, my friends, is even more so. Do not, I repeat, and please listen to me right now, do not underestimate what Jesus can do to put your life back together, no more than that, back into the shape he intended all along. You know, as a pastor in a church that is uh, just about, last survey for Bridgetown was just about 70% single and under the age of 35. In that context, I get front row seats to watch the devastating effects of pornea and sexual immorality on men and women. But I also get front row seats to watch Jesus do his thing. And I cannot tell you, on a serious note, honest to God, I cannot tell you how many people I have seen remade from the inside out after the tearing of that cod. You know, there's a guy in our church who, um, just a few months ago, it wasn't long ago at all, was coming out of a gnarly past with drugs, alcohol, and all that goes with it. Um, Comes to faith in Jesus, is baptized. Um, His life is is turned upside down and inside out by Jesus. And one night, he's at church, it's a Sunday night, and he's at church, and he's in the middle of worship, in God's presence, and then across the room, he sees a prostitute that he had hired just a few months before. So obviously, he's wrecked, right? Like church is lame at that point. But after the gathering, true story, he went up to her and he asked for her forgiveness and he made an apology and he made things right. That has Jesus written all over it. Now, I know that's an extreme example And maybe we should get a little bit more realistic. And maybe you're thinking, dude, who are you to talk? You have no clue. You married at like 12 and you were a virgin, you know? (laughs) I'm just not gonna talk about that part. Um, You know, my best friend and his wife, who uh, they've been married a few years, he wasn't able to make it tonight. But uh, amazing people, they are both model good looking and they both came to faith later in life after years and years of promiscuity, I guess that's what you do when you look like a model, I don't know, but they're really good looking, (laughs) and they use that to their advantage. Um, And here they are, now followers of Jesus, years later, a married couple, sexually active, obviously, with one another, and if they would hear, if they were here, and I was talking to them about this, if they were here, they would tell you that the past is unchangeable, but it's not unredeemable that Jesus has done such a healing work in them that not only do they have a healthy marriage and a thriving sex life, but they would argue they no longer feel any pain. It's basically the difference between a wound and a scar. A wound, whether it's self-inflicted or from somebody else or it's your own fault or it's the world or it's abuse or it's whatever, a wound... When you touch it, it still hurts. When you touch it, it still bleeds. When you get around it, it's still in danger of infection. But a, but a scar, this, what did I say? It's the difference between a wound and a scar. What did I say? I said that? Good, I'm, I'm getting tired. Like, sorry, moving on. A scar, on the other hand, this was supposed to be the really good, like, moving part where you all start to cry. This, dang it. This part's good. Let's just pretend like it was all smooth. But a scar, when you touch it, the pain is gone. And scars can actually be used for good, right? Because scars tell a story that are a warning about danger, but also are a story about healing. And you carry them with you for the rest of your life. I have a giant scar on my left leg from a cycling accident, right? You carry it with you the rest. I have one on my forehead. It's an awesome story with that one. You carry it with you the rest of your life, but it doesn't hurt anymore. 
and it's there to tell a story. As followers of Jesus, we have so much hope, right? Listen to the end of this passage right here. Paul goes on to write this. Do you not know, this is in 19, that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? That's, that's powerful, right? God's home address is you. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are filled with the Spirit of God, meaning the active, dynamic presence of God, whom you have received, it's a gift, and you are not your own. I love that. You belong to somebody else, and it's not your boyfriend or your fiance or your husband or your wife. You belong to Jesus. And then he says this, you were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your bodies. Now in the first century, Corinth was a hub for sex trafficking all over the Mediterranean and all over the Roman Empire. There was a slave market, as far as we can tell, right in the center of town. Women and children as well were bought and sold like property. But if you wanted, you could go down to the market and buy a woman, and if she wanted, you could set her free and make her your wife. That is the imagery right here. Our God is the God who goes down to the slave market, and he buys the shattered human who has known nothing but the pain of rape and abuse and the dehumanizing cruelty of men. And he sets her free. And he says, you want me? Because I want you. And he calls her his bride. I am that woman. And maybe you are too. Maybe you are too. 